He has more than 20 Formula One World Championship titles to his name when you combine both the drivers and the constructors' crowns. More than 200 Formula One race victories as well. Adrian Newey is often and understandably credited as being the greatest race car designer of all time. But along with that title comes a question. What is it that makes Adrian Newey quite so good? To answer that question, you really need to take a look at the man himself and what lies behind that headset and the studious expression on his face, almost permanently applied during a Grand Prix weekend. Adrian Newey comes across as a quietly spoken, mild-mannered and rather polite sort of fellow. But underneath that, there's a lot more to it. He's a slightly lively character with a slight rebellious streak and a career that's punctuated with missteps and little gaps in his CV. And that starts all the way back at the beginning of his Formula One career, which is a little bit longer ago than many people realise. He started with the Fittipaldi Automotive Team as Chief Aerodynamicist in 1980, not long out of university. And Newey's education had already seen one of those trademark interruptions to his Formula One career, if you like, after he was expelled from school for blowing out a stained glass window using the school's sound system. And sort of hijinks like that are not entirely unknown in Newey's future career either. After leaving the Fittipaldi team, he found a role at March Engineering and a new type of racing altogether. He went off to the United States and took part in IndyCar, or CART as it was then called. His team and his car designs won the Indy 500 twice as well as the CART Championship before he made a return to Europe and a return to Formula One. And during that return, he encountered a man who would go on to become his nemesis, Ross Braun. The two of them worked jointly together on the development of the 1986 Lola Haas. Just imagine that, a car developed jointly by Ross Braun and Adrian Newey. It should be an unbeatable force. It turned out to be a bit of a lame duck and the team closed its doors at the end of 1986, leaving Newey once again out of the Formula One fold for a little while. Newey came out of the wilderness once more though, to join the Leighton House March team as its chief designer, and he had a bit more of an impact at that team. The Leighton House cars were well regarded and sort of overperformed for the expectations of that team in 1988 and 1989. However, the 1990 car wasn't quite as good as the team expected, and Newey, amazingly, was fired as chief designer. Just imagine that, Adrian Newey as your chief designer, and you fire him for your Formula One team. In hindsight, someone made a big error. Newey's career was punctuated by a number of periods where he wasn't actively working on the design of Formula One cars, switching teams from Williams to McLaren and then from McLaren via flirtation with both the Jaguar team and the Ferrari team. Just imagine that if Adrian Newey had joined Ferrari, the history books would look certainly a little bit different, I suspect. And then going to Red Bull Racing, even during his time at Red Bull Racing, at one point he took a step back and decided not to be involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the team and the design of the cars, handing over to Rob Marshall for a period. And during those periods out from Formula One, Adrian Newey's, shall we say, extracurricular activities show a real insight to the man and his constantly inquisitive mind. Newey enjoys the sport of motor racing. He enjoys high performance activities. He's got his own collection of high performance cars, notably a GT40, a Jaguar, and his own Red Bull RB5 Formula One car, which he enjoys driving around circuits from time to time. Newey's also competed in professional motorsport himself. He finished fourth in class at the Le Mans 24 hours, driving a privately entered Ferrari. So Newey, you can see, has a slight wild child element in there. There's also a story about when Red Bull won one of their world championships with Sebastian Vettel. Newey wasn't at the track, so he drove over in his GT40 to Christian Horner's house, which has a very lovely manicured and beautifully presented lawn, and proceeded to do donuts on the lawn to celebrate that world championship victory. The story may be apocryphal, but it's one that I've heard told by both members of the Red Bull team and those who saw the aftermath, so perhaps there's something to it. And it shows that lively character of Adrian Newey. 
But during other times out from Formula One, he's looked at other areas of engineering. He wanted to design a boat for the America's Cup, for example. He's designed high performance production cars and looked at other areas of engineering as well. So Adrian Newey's mind is constantly inquisitive. And that's something that I think comes across in his career success as well. Adrian Newey's way of working, though, is regularly described as being positively anachronistic. The man doesn't seem to like technology very much. In fact, when he started in Formula One, nobody really used computers to design the cars, but they very quickly switched over to fully operating on computer-aided design and 3D CAD and various simulation systems. But Newey himself, well, he resisted that change and stuck very much to the old-fashioned way of drawing with a pen and paper on a big drawing board in his office. And he's one of the last real engineers to do that. Also, at the racetrack, you see Newey constantly walking around, not holding onto a mobile phone or some sort of computational pad. He's just got the old-fashioned notebook and a pen to write his thoughts down in and maybe make the odd sketch every now and again. One of the last few engineers to do that as well. An old-fashioned technology almost permeates its way through the Red Bull team at present. If you take a look at the Red Bull wind tunnel, at least the one they're using at the moment, it's by far the oldest in use in Formula One, and until recently even had wooden blades in the fan, something that nobody else had seen really since the 1950s. Well, perhaps it's a case of uh, Carol Smith's famous quote that the last of the old will always beat the first of the new, meaning that Newey's old-fashioned ways of working just give him a big advantage over younger engineers who've come into the sport since. But I think that's doing the man a real disservice. First principles engineering are fine, but there's so much more to the way Adrian Newey works. While Newey's way of working may seem a little bit old-fashioned, the engineer in him has always pushed technology to the absolute limit of the cutting edge and sometimes a little bit beyond. And that goes all the way through his career as a race car designer. And a great sign of this can be found in this, the 1989 Leighton House, shown here upside down at the start of the French Grand Prix. The diffuser on that car was a work of art. The way the exhaust exited through the channels in the diffuser was something completely new to the sport. From pictures of this incident, the then dominant McLaren team took a good look at the back of that Leighton House and completely copied the design created by Newey on that car for the MP45B. And that was really the first Adrian Newey design part to appear on the McLaren range of cars. It would not be the last. Newey, though, came up with technology all the way through his career, and even if it wasn't his own work, he'd encourage the others around him to develop new techniques and use new technologies to make the cars go around the track faster, pushing the boundaries of the regulations and pushing the regulations as they were has gone on to become something of an Adrian Newey trait. And no car shows that more clearly than the 1998 McLaren, a car that was so packed with technology that it again got the regulations changed over and over again. It was the first hybrid car to ever be used in Formula One. It had trick braking systems. It had advanced material systems in it. There was so much going on with this completely dominant car that it really upset the sport of Formula One. Newey had done it again and pushed the boundaries so far that the rules were changed aggressively against his team and his design concepts. And of course, that's not the last time that happened. Think back to the Red Bull RB6 and its later variant and the arrival of the blown diffuser in Formula One using Renault power units or Renault V8 engines the Red Bull team absolutely mastered the regulations and got a huge advantage over the field. An advantage that only partially went away in 2009 and Honda and Braun's invention of the double diffuser. Something Newey didn't get quite right. Almost as frequent as Newey's, shall we say, career sabbaticals, is Newey getting the design of a car not quite right. His ability to push the limits of the technology and of the regulations, and sometimes pushing the limits in his own life a little bit too far, manifests itself in cars that don't necessarily work as well as they should do. And I mentioned in his own life, I mentioned earlier on, his uh, historic racing cars, the GT40, the Jaguar, both of which he's crashed at high speed, along with a Ginetta in British club racing as well. Adrian Newey even fell off an electric motorcycle on holiday recently and nearly ruled himself out 
of a couple more years of Formula One. Fortunately, some urgent medical care <laughs> saved him from that fate. But there have been cars through Newey's career that where he's pushed the limit a little bit too far. And there is no better example of it than this, the lost McLaren, the MP418. This car never started a Grand Prix because, well, the team never quite got it to work. It was too tightly packaged, it caught fire quite a lot, and more than once it simply just fell apart. And this is an example of Newey studying the regulation, studying the technology and pushing it as far as it can go pushing it a bit too far and then learning from those mistakes. The follow-up car was more successful and learned the lessons of the failings of this car. But sometimes the regulations may push Newey a little bit too far. An example of this is the Red Bull RB10 or RB10 as some people called it at the time. After a period of dominance going up to the end of the 2013 season, Red Bull developed a new 2014 car in an era that became absolutely dominated by Mercedes and started a long-running rivalry between the two teams. The RB10 was not a success. Newey largely blames the Renault power unit. Others suggest the chassis wasn't quite right either. Too tightly packaged. Maybe some other fundamental errors within the design of the car. Depends who you listen to and how close they are with either Red Bull or Renault. But the car was not a success and knew he actually took a step back from the sport of Formula One at that point because he felt not properly supported by the power unit supplier at the time. But he was tempted back, wasn't he, by the new technical regulations introduced by his old nemesis, Ross Braun, and the arrival of Honda as power unit provider. That temptation to come back to the leading edge of Formula One has resulted in yet more success. The utterly dominant Red Bull RB18 and RB19. These cars look absolutely the class of the field at present. With all of that in mind then, just what is it that makes Adrian Newey so good? Well, it's all of the things we've just been discussing, along with that mild-mannered characteristic that makes Adrian Newey so approachable to other people and engineers within the organisations he works in. They can come up with, to him with suggestions and innovations, and he takes them all on board. But on top of that, all of those things combine to create an engineer that, along with his nemesis, Ross Braun, has gone on to defend fine four decades of Grand Prix engineering. And it's seemingly not over yet. Adrian Newey has no plans to retire anytime soon, which probably means a lot more race wins and at least a few more world championships. And that might be bad news for all of his rivals. If you want to find out more about Adrian Newey and learn a little bit more about the man from the man himself, well, don't forget to tune in to the Beyond the Grid podcast, where Adrian Newey discusses all of these things with Tom Clarkson. It's well worth a listen.